Hi, Liz. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> We're at SVP. Yeah, right at the end of SVP. Yeah. It's kind of sad, actually. I know. It went by fast, but it also feels like I've been here for a really long time. I feel like it went by so fast, and there's so many people I meant to talk to and haven't even seen. No. How is that possible? There aren't that many people here, uh, are there? I haven't seen people either. Yeah. They're just they're all walking in different circles as me, apparently. Yeah, I guess. It's hard when you have, you know, three sessions at a time and so yeah. many talks, and you just miss everybody. I know. It's so hard to get to all the ones you want to see as well. Yeah. So, how have you liked everything? Did you see any amazing talks that were really cool? There's been a couple of really good ones, especially in the Romer session. Mm. I saw a couple of really good talks. Yep, um, and we interviewed quite a few people from the Romer session. Yeah. So that's good. We get yeah. to hear about what they've been doing. Yeah, there were definitely some really awesome talks. Lots of things that I was like, oh, I wish I could do that. Yeah. That looks cool. That is cool. That's one of the best things about these conferences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Getting inspired. What about you? What was your favorite? Uh, I really liked the molecular oh. session. That uh, was yeah. probably yeah. the highlight for me. But there was also a really good taphonomy session, too, where there was yeah. a lot of good stuff on you know, keratin preservation and mm-hmm. things like that. So um, those are probably my favorites. Yeah. yeah. I was sad because there was only one pterosaur yeah. talk I in the entire that. conference. How is there so. only one pterosaur <laughs> talk? Aren't there, how many people study pterosaurs? Yeah, there were only even really three posters as well because wow. two people didn't show. So it was a bit sad for pterosaur You're stuff not this well year. Represented at all. No. But, well, oh you well. had a poster though, right? Yes. So, yes, I did. Let's talk about that. How was your poster? It was good. So I was talking about um, neural anatomy, postcranial kind of neural anatomy of pterosaurs. Okay. So looking at the sacrum and at what we can learn from looking at the neural canal size. And you, know, you can actually relate that to locomotion because hmm. in modern animals you get an enlargement in the kind of in the sacrum and also in the... Um, like brachial area where the arms are and that's kind of dependent how big that is is dependent on what kind of locomotion they do so I was kind of looking at that in pterosaurs and seeing what we can tell um with my whopping sample size of three because <laughs> pterosaurs. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, nobody's ever looked at all at that, like any postcranial nervous system stuff in pterosaurs. There's just nothing. It's all endocasts. Yeah. So it's been a bit of an uphill battle, but it's still good. I enjoyed it. Okay. You had a poster as well yeah, in the I prize did. session. Yes, uh-huh. so, which I don't think I have any chance of winning, by the way. <laughs> I don't think that the prize people came and talked to me, but that's <laughs> fine. That's totally fine. I had a great time. And yeah, it was a. It's the first chapter of my dissertation, mm-hmm. looking at mammoth preservation in different depositional environments. Uh, so mm-hmm. I am interested in studying preservation of biomolecules in situ. And okay. Most people, when they're looking at organics, extract the organics because mm-hmm. that's a good way of getting at them and figuring out if there's any organic preservation at all. But I'm interested in how the bone might actually protect the organic material. Ah, cool. So I'm doing some surface mapping using mass spectrometry and stuff like that, and also looking at lipids. So it went well. I had some yeah. really interesting interesting conversations with people, <laughs> some of whom hated my methods, but wanted to talk to me anyways, <laughs> and it was it was a very enlightening experience, yeah. so I feel like I got a lot out of it. That's good, yeah. that's good. Yeah, it was fun. I had a strange bubble with the two people next to me not showing up, and so oh, I just had weird. nobody on either side of me, so it was a little bit weird, but it uh, meant I had lots of space, which was good. Yeah, that is nice. Uh, it's, it's really crowded in there. Yes. It's insane. Yeah. And we, so in the poster session, how many posters do you think there are on a given day? hundred? Yeah, that seems right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's four days, hundred posters, and then there are also all the vendors and everything. Yeah. And I interviewed one of the vendors who are doing these, this really cool startup with their, um, they're called Permia. Oh, so yeah. So you can listen to that. Um, and they're, they're really cool dudes. They based all their stuff on extant animals, and they're very interested in making oh. it anatomically correct, which I oh, think is that's very neat. important. Yeah. yeah. So they were really fun to talk to. Um, and then, yeah, there's just so many talks. There's just no way to do everything. My feet feel no. like they're going to fall off. I know. <sighs> I think and it's weird because, like, yesterday there were hardly any talks I was interested in. And then today it was suddenly, like, so many things I wanted to go mm-hmm. to and overlapping everything. And it's the last day, so I don't want to be here all day. I know. You know, I want to go get ready for the party right. tonight. But there's talks and... 
too many things. Yeah, too, way too many things. And then we went the first night here. We got to go to the museum, and yeah. that was awesome. Oh, that Ceratopsian wall, oh, it's I've my seen favorite. so many times. And as a former slash sort of current <laughs> Ceratopsian worker, that's that was a massive highlight Isn't for me. It, it was so cool. It is so cool. I think we can find a photo somewhere to put it up on the website oh, so yeah. people can see it. Because I just think amazing. I took about eight on okay, my phone. We'll so. post all of them. All of them are going up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's such a cool museum. It's it so is. it's so new and it's so well yeah. done and there's just so much cool stuff there. and it overlooks the valley oh, as well so, so you gorgeous. get an awesome view of salt lake city yes. it's really neat yes and we all ate all of the cheeses from all around all the, the world yes. yes so we just had a party in the museum <laughs> which i just that's one of my favorite parts about svp yeah, i think it's the first night you get to be there when it's closed yeah. down and just yeah. have a party with all your paleontology yeah. friends yeah it's like night at the museum yeah. with food and lots of paleontologists. <laughs> yes. yeah. Definitely a highlight. Uh, oh man, so yeah, it's over. We, I know. We go to the party tonight Sad. and that's it. Uh, but we have next year yeah. and next year... Canada! It's in Canada! Yeah. Which you must be really excited about. I am. So next year it's in Calgary, which is not far from my home of Edmonton. Uh-huh. So I'm really excited about that because it's almost like going home. I can kind of have an excuse to go home for a bit. But uh, I think it'll be really neat because Calgary, the area around Calgary is really famous for like late Cretaceous, especially dinosaur fossils, but just generally late Cretaceous fossils. So I think it'll be really great. And there will be some awesome field trips mm. to Dinosaur Provincial Park, I bet. Cool, I and might have to do that. potentially even things like Burgess Shale, which is not all that far from Calgary. Gasping. So that I think it would be amazing. I think it will be really cool. And I think that's the reason why it's a bit earlier than oh. usual, because... Canada, you know, Alberta in, say, o- end of October or November is cold and snowy. Yeah, so right now at home, it's snowy. Oh, wow. Which is actually uncommon. It's not normally this snowy at this time of year, but it's very snowy right now. So in order to be able to do field trips, you kind of have to do it in the summer. <laughs> so Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That will be cool. I'm looking forward to it because I've never really been to Canada. Yeah. There's so much good paleontology up there. I'm super excited. That's great. So... so. Yeah, so let's go to a party. Yeah. You guys can enjoy all of the interviews that we've done, and we're going to go to a party. Yeah, all, all the interviews that mostly Caitlin did. <laughs> but I did a few. <laughs> yes, so, yeah. to- total team efforts. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoy it. Bye. Bye. I'm here with Brian Sweetek, and he's going to tell us all about what it's like to be in Salt Lake City, because you've been here for a while, right? Yeah, about five years, and it's not as boring as people would have you believe. Okay. We, and we have real beer here, which is one of the benefits of, of hosting uh, SVP, I guess, in this location. We have a great counterculture of breweries and distilleries. Yeah, and that does surprise people, doesn't it? They don't expect that, do they? Yeah, well, we have some insane liquor laws, things like the Zion Curtain, where you're not allowed to see your beer being poured or drink being made at a restaurant for some reason. That's weird. But it is really weird. But yeah, it's like we, since 2010, you know, so, so long ago in the past, we, we have actual bars and things now. And uh, Salt Lake City, it, it's neat. It's this weird little like liberal, arty, hipstery blip in a very red state. So it, it makes it fun to live in. Yeah, and it's great for paleontology as well, right? Because Absolutely. Because there's a the University of Utah, and then there's mm-hmm. also the Natural History Museum of Utah. And, uh, and we have the Department of Natural Resources with our geological survey, wow. and we have, you know, most most of the land, as far as I know in Utah, is um, owned by the federal government. So it's a lot of BLM land, it's mm-hmm. a lot of national park land, it's a lot of uh, forestry service. So that means that a lot of it's preserved. It's not like it was back where I came from in New Jersey, where everything is basically private property, it's paved over or, or forested. Here, everything is wide open. That's so you great. just walk right up to the fossils. And they're all over the place, aren't they? Absolutely. I mean, the eastern part of the state is basically like a dinosaur dreamland. You know, whether you're interested in the beginning of the age of dinosaurs or like the heyday of those like Jurassic giants like a 
Ankylosaurus and Stegosaurus and all those, or you know just new Cretaceous species that are you know really put Utah on the map in, in recent years. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. And we do have other fossils as well, but you know at least for dinosaurs, uh, this is really. I, I feel silly saying this because it's a call. It's a throwback to what uh, Brigham Young said: the Mormon pioneer came out here. But this is the place. This is the place for dinosaurs. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. So you've worked in the collections at the museum here, right? So, and that's then right. you've also been out to the field with them as well. So what sorts mm-hmm. of things have you done with the museum? So yeah, in the museum I volunteer in the collections, and that's uh, like paleo paperwork. Okay. And it's an essential part of the thing. I mean, the, yeah. like the the glamour and glory of it is out in the field. You know, you find your specimen, or you dig something up, or you know, even the lab. You know, you get assigned a skull. It's, you know, you get to name or whatever it is. That's the stuff that everybody wants to do. But collections, I mean, that's where the science happens. Mm-hmm. That's you know, we've got decades of material, some of which have been wrapped up in newspapers since the 1960s, that need to be unwrapped, identified, put in their contexts uh, to let research happen. To give you an example, um, before this meeting, I had to go through the holotype cabinet. So this is the cabinet where all the the name-bearing specimens wow. for you know our dinosaurs and various other animals mm-hmm. are. And we had one for Nothernica, so this uh, Therizinosaur, this tubby, feathery, Freddy Krueger clawed Those things aberration thing. Yeah, yeah, I know. It looks like it should be friendly, but then you look at the claws. Mm, mm-hmm. mm, no, nope. not so sure. Um, but there are all these boxes that were not archival. It's just cardboard boxes, right. plastic bags, things like that that came from the field. Um, most of the major bones had already been like cut in, like taken care of very carefully. But as I was sorting through all those bags of fragments, I found about five additional bones of the holotype that were just mixed in as a claw, uh, some vertebrae from the end of the tail. So nothing that dramatically changes what this animal looks like, but just hiding in the collection yeah. because nobody had looked at it before wow. or all these other little pieces. So that's you know the important part of, of the collection's work. And it's just fun to just throw open cabinets and see what's in there. Definitely. I mean, most, as we know, or I imagine most listeners know, uh, most of what a museum has is behind the scenes. It's in collections. You know, the exhibits is just a very small fraction of it. So, you know, behind the scenes, you have you know, the history of the organisms themselves. You have the history of um, science and, and um, exploration embodied in all that. So everything tells these multiple intertwining stories. So it's awesome to just throw open the cabinet totally. and see what's in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I spend a lot of my time going out in the field as well. Not only with the Naturalist Museum of Utah, but uh, various crews have taken me you know, everywhere from you know, the Eocene of uh, Saskatchewan to the Pleistocene of uh, northern Mexico, you know, all throughout the Four Corners. So basically any given weekend when somebody says, like, are you free and do you want to dig up bones? It's, yeah, yes. <laughs> eight feet tracks for the desert. Yeah, I mean, it's not even a question. <laughs> Okay, what about specifically Utah? What what mm-hmm. kind of sites have you been out to? And tell me a little bit about them and why they're awesome. Yeah, so one of my favorites is a Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. Ah, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is currently being excavated by um, the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh with a crew led by uh, Joe Peterson and uh, John Warnock and Steve Clawson. So I go out there, I'm basically like you know, doing the grunt work, you know, digging things up and helping them you know, find new sites and actually have a new dinosaur site about a half mile from where the major quarry is. Ooh. But the neat research going on there is trying to suss out what actually happened at this site because there are over 48 individual allosaurus represented there. It's a big bone jumble. We don't get complete skeletons, unfortunately. Okay. But it's probably the densest accumulation of Jurassic dinosaur bones any, anywhere in the world. Uh, and so it's been a mystery and all these different interpretations of what happened. Some people say it was a predator trap like La Brea. Mm-hmm. Some people suggest that um, you know something you know got bogged in there and kind of poisoned the water and as these animals came to drink they all died. Uh, there's not really an answer yet for this. So this so the past four years, this crew's been going out, and I've been joining them for at least three of those, and hopefully I'll keep going out with them, um, trying to figure out just, like, geologically, in terms of the taphonomy, like, what, how did this come to be, and why is it so dominated by Allosaurus? Because any other Morrison formation bone assemblage like this, you get a lot of sauropods. Sauropods, right. Right, yeah, and usually uh, juveniles and stuff, and here it's chock full of predators. Weird. Why? Why is that happening? So hopefully we'll, we'll get an answer to that. That's very uh, cool. So that's one of my favorites, and uh, there are, you know, some great trials sites out near um, Arches and Canyonlands National Parks in the eastern part of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, I found some really neat fossil fish out there. Mm. You know, it's one of those things where you go looking. You know, I can fanboy out about animals a little bit and be like, I want to find a dinosaur, but it was just I was getting depressed about not finding anything and just went up onto this little part of a ridge, and there are just fish right there just in this lab. They're split open. 
Um, and uh, the, the big place uh, in the southern part of the state is Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Mm-hmm. And that was the last place in the uh, continental or contiguous United States that was mapped. It, you know, it only became a national monument in the late 1990s. And that's where a lot of our you know, superstar Utah dinosaurs are coming out from, things like Cosmoceratops, you know, the one that was heralded as the horniest dinosaur ever because you know, everybody needs a superlative, right? right. Um, new species of tyrannosaurs, ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs, um, you know, just so many new finds coming out of this, you know, juniper strewn badlands. Wow. So, you know, from from the south all the way up through the east, you know, if you like dinosaurs, it's fantastic. And then towards the west, you have lots of trilobites and Cambrian fossils. So really, I mean, this is one of the most fossiliferous states I can think of and has a little something for everybody. Yeah. And, and there's some just spots you can go to that really puts time in perspective. So if you go to Dinosaur National Monument, it has the greatest number of geologic exposures uh, in any one place out of all the national parks. So you can stand there and you can see where sea waves have come in and gone out and gotten replaced by floodplains and forests and then turned to desert you know, over tens of millions of years and it really puts things in perspective. That's awesome. So this is obviously a great place for SVP to be happening then. Well, absolutely. Everything is relatively close too. I mean within three or four hours you can be in almost any time period you choose. You can time travel by highway <laughs> and be almost anywhere. So I mean that's the reason that I moved here is that it's so centrally located not even just in Utah. You can get to almost anywhere in the west within yeah. about eight hours. So if you like field work and paleontology, this is definitely the, a good home base to have. Awesome. So what are you looking forward to about the conference? Anything in particular you want to see talk-wise or anybody you want to meet? Oh, I mean, one of the great things I love about this community is that so many of us are fans of each other, is that whether you're you know, a writer like myself or a professional paleontologist or you know, um, you, know, you make movies or, or whatever it is, like we all come here and we kind of geek out yeah. with each other about <laughs> what we're excited about. Um, you know, it, it's better than Comic-Con, I think, in terms of just the sheer enthusiasm sure, for the man. new science. And I, I just like being surprised. I mean, there are certain talks I can always pick out. Okay, that looks interesting. That looks really cool. Like yesterday morning, I saw a talk by Zhao Ming Wang from um, the Natural Museum of Los Angeles about a giant otter, an otter that's like twice the size of the largest otter alive wow. today from the six million year old deposits in China. Just, yeah, he was apologizing for the quality of the skull. It was actually beautiful. It was crushed, but it's like this near complete skull of yeah. this amazing uh, otter that, you know, I you no know, idea existed before. The before is only known from teeth. And now wow. it's like this badger like giant otter thing that was running around China six million years ago. Um, so things like that, I, I like that I can pick out titles like, hey, that's going to be cool. But I like the surprises. I like, you know, honestly, not every title is as evocative as you would expect. Yeah. So it would be something like, you know, a report on a new theropod from whatever formation. Then you go, it's like two nearly complete skeletons with feathers, of the, and they have a restoration of the whole thing, <laughs> yeah. and just everyone is blown away. So I like just kind of wandering through the sessions and the posters and just being caught by surprise. Because, I mean, the fossil record is constantly surprising us every time you know we can't predict what we're going to find any time that we um, have a question like we're never going to know what colors dinosaurs were or you know what they sounded like or so, something shows up that you know totally changes what we thought we knew yeah and, and that's that's the thing is and getting excited about this stuff because you you know there's always more mm-hmm. than what you're seeing you know it's a 10 minute talk or it's a poster presentation everything is you know kind of like the highlights version and then you know hopefully within you know a year a couple of years whatever it is you get the full report and mm-hmm. this is absolutely mind-blowing yeah, and you can hope to like you know keep track of papers and know what's going on, but you come to a conference like this, and there's yeah. so much going on right now in paleontology, especially incorporating new technologies and mm-hmm. finding out things that we never thought we could ever know from the fossil record. Absolutely, and it, it's a good chance to get outside your comfort zone in mm-hmm. terms of the science that you like. So you know, for people who like dinosaurs, I'd say like, like go to, go to some mammal talks. Yeah. Mammal people go to some dinosaur talks, and you get to see like the breadth of, of the discipline and things that you never would have expected otherwise. Like I just was looking at a poster. Uh, I knew that you know mammals do this before, but it was neat to actually see it. You know, to be reminded of it of uh, white-tailed deer that um, were laying down lines of arrested growth. So these very sharp lines in their growth pattern, where they cease growth for a little while mm-hmm. and then continue. And that's supposed to be a very reptilian trait, but mammals do it yeah. as well. And this has implications for figuring out the physiology of extinct organisms and you know dinosaurian endothermy and how they did it. So just this simple little connection, you know, that might bridge these these major questions that we have. So. I mean, that's one of the great things about this conference is that you can sample a little bit of everything and see how, like, as you mentioned, these... um 
you know, new technologies, new insights can be applied so widely yeah. across the field. And things that, you know, even though the basics of how we find fossils are more or less the same mm-hmm. as they were over 100 years ago, the um, technology and the techniques being brought to bear to figure this out <laughs> is absolutely mind-blowing. All right, cool. Um, let's go walk around and look at some skulls. Let's yeah? do, yes. All right, cool. Don't have to ask me twice. Okay. Who is this? What are we looking at? <laughs> we are looking at a Tyrannosaur skull. That's uh, so why I'm kind of surprised there's not like a line bowing to it the way that people <laughs> right? adore Tyrannosaurus sometimes. So it's actually uh, Lythronax argestis, so the gore king of the Southwest, which I thought was my title whenever I went to Sugar House Barbecue. But <laughs> in any case, uh, yeah, this is one of our newest Tyrannosaurs. It's about 80 million years old, around the same time as uh, Diabloceratops. Mm-hmm. And at least um, as far as been hypothesized so far, it's said that this dinosaur is a close relationship relationship to our favorite Tyrannosaurus rex because uh, of certain features in the skull, particularly the way that the back of the skull flares out so that the eyes would have been spaced a little bit further apart and giving this dinosaur binocular vision. So this is one of the first Tyrannosaurs to really have that stereoscopic narrowing down to to go after prey. Uh, So it wasn't quite as big as uh, T-Rex was. It was probably about half size. But still, it's got this, you know, the characteristic deep skull with the really thick, uh, almost railroad spike kind of teeth. Um, and I, I love the uh, restoration that uh, they present here with, by uh, Andrea Tuchin as well because it's fluffy. And I just, I love me some fluffy tyrannosaurs. Agreed. I agree completely. It looks kind of small. Yeah, it, it's not quite, it, it's got like that classic deep skulled nasty look, but it's like the, the half size <laughs> yeah. version. Yeah. Yeah, is this so? This is the is cast of the holotype. Yes, yeah, so this is the cast of the holotype. And are there more individuals that have been found, or is this the only one? So far, this is the only one okay. that's been found. Uh, the Wawuk Formation is kind of hard to work. It's one of these formations where it's very difficult to find fossils, but when you find something, it's usually well preserved and it's something interesting and, and unique. So, you know, I'm hoping that more will turn up in the near future. Awesome. But so far, that this is it as, as far as light their next goes. So, do, is, does anybody have any ideas about whether this is full grown or not? Or or is that sort of, we have to wait to find more? It seems to fall into that sub-adult category okay. that's, you know, it's not fully grown. But then again, I mean, what is mature for, for a dinosaur? It's like they keep growing until, you know, they hit a certain point and they get that little line on their bones, the uh, external fundamental system that you now tells us they've stopped growing and we can call it skeletally mature. Mm-hmm. But we know from medullary bone, that special bone tissue that they've, you know, dinosaurs formed in their long bones uh, when the females were creating eggs, that they started reproducing early. Like, that they started right. reproducing long before before their skeleton has stopped growing. So even though this was not what we call, I guess, a skeletally full-grown tyrannosaur, for all intents and purposes, it was an adult. Yep. Okay, cool. And what do we have behind us staring at us right now? Yeah, so that, that's Cosmoceratops. That was about uh, five million years later after uh, Diabloceratops and uh, Lythronax. And this is the one that was heralded as, as the horniest dinosaur ever. I, like, I like to think of it, though, as having this emo comb over. That's what it looks from like to be, yeah. Front, or like, like very, a fringe, like, Tom maybe? DeLonge yeah. kind of <laughs> style um, of these spices just kind of flopped over and you know go around the border of the frill. It's, oh. it's brow horns stick out sideways. It's got a very blade-like nasal horn. So this is one of the many horn dinosaurs that was roaming around southern Utah about 75 million years ago and fits into this idea that there was something weird going on around 75 million years ago um, in Laramidia, so this western subcontinent uh, of North America, where if you look at Alaska, if you look at Alberta, if you look at Man- Montana and Utah and Texas and down to Mexico... In each basin, the dinosaurs are different species, if not genera, and nobody really knows why. One idea is that there are geographic barriers, like river systems or, or the Rocky Mountains that were starting to be pushed up during that time um, that separated them and created like, these little islands of evolution. Uh, for others, it's a matter of, of turnover, that dinosaurs are very sensitive to the environments in which they lived, and as vegetation changed, as climate shifted, uh, you, you got new species coming and going throughout mm-hmm. their ranges. And it's very different from what you find later, like those classic Hell Creek-type formations where you, basically you have T-Rex from Canada all the way down almost into Mexico. You yeah. have Triceratops over the same range. You know, about 10 million years earlier, it was different dinosaurs everywhere. So, you know, with each new find, it's not only, you know, the mystery of how this animal it lived, but this big pattern of evolution, how, how it worked. Cool. All right, let's go wander and see what yeah. else we can find. Okay, what do we have here? 
So here we have uh, Utah Ceratops, one of our other horned dinosaurs from uh, Grand Staircase, surrounded by reprints. So, so in this, uh, you know, almost uh, homage <laughs> to, yes. to this dinosaur. Um, and this was a neighbor of uh, Cosmoceratops. It lived in about the same place at about the same time. And, uh, you know, it, it really brings up questions about what these dinosaurs were doing. I mean, their ornamentation was very, very different. So Utah Ceratops had a much more blunt nose horn. Its brow horns kind of stick out to the side, but they're not nearly as long. It doesn't have the same kind of flopped over um, horns along the frill. So, I mean, they're very visually distinct from each other. They're clearly different dinosaurs. But in terms of what they're eating, in terms of like their jaw mechanics and all that stuff, they're pretty similar. So this brings up these questions of like niche partitioning. How did you have these similar dinosaurs making a living in the same habitat? Or are they actually living in the same habitat? Are they just get, getting buried here? One lives in the uplands, the other lives in the lowlands. It's just the upland ones got buried down here for some reason. Uh-huh. So there are all these you know ecological questions that come out of finding the, these animals. But this is another one of our recent uh, dinosaur discoveries that has really you know highlighted that um, Utah's this overlooked hotspot for finding dinosaur fossils. Awesome. Well, I think we're out of specimens now, aren't we? We've yeah, seen them all. Unfortunately, I wish there were more. Yeah. Well, people, everybody got to go to the museum on the first That's night, yes. and that was awesome. The museum's amazing. How old is it? How long has it been uh, It's around? only been open for about five years Yeah. In its, in its latest incarnation. It seems really new, so it was amazing. So a lot yeah. of people got to check that out, and we'll have some photos up uh, on the website when we post this whole thing that we're doing right now. And um, thank you very much for talking to oh, me. Been pl- I'm always happy to talk about skulls and dinosaurs. Yes, me too. All right, enjoy the conference. Thanks. Hey, you too. Bye. I'm here with Manuel and Michael Fleischman, and they have a Kickstarter right now, and it's called Permia, and I would love it if you guys would tell our listeners a little bit about what you have going on here. Sure. Well, I guess, Manuel, if you don't mind, I can start on yep, this. Sure, go ahead. Right okay, so Permia, in a nutshell, is a clothing and collectibles brand. I think that's probably the best way to reference it. And um, currently, our Kickstarter is mainly focused on putting into production T-shirts that feature prehistoric life on them. We have artwork that was cultivated with the kind assistance of Scott Hartman, who helped us to develop the skeletals, life reconstructions, everything that goes along with that. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to have kind of a launch event here at SVP 2016. So I think that's probably the best synopsis of uh, Permia that I could give you at the moment. Awesome. So how did you guys get into extinct reptiles exactly? Well, it probably started from our childhood. Uh, Our mother used to get us a whole ton of... um, documentaries and books on the subject and we just became obsessed at a very early age um, and we never really grew out of it so ever since then we've sort of set our sights on starting a business that in some way related to paleontology um, and finally we got uh, <laughs> the uh, the vigor and uh, necessary assets to put it together and uh, Thus far, it's been very enjoyable. So Great. And so the things that I'm looking at right now look very anatomically correct. And you chose colors based on living animals. So explain to me why that was important to you, that these things were you know, less cartoony and more actually like these animals that once lived. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, also dates back to our original fascination with paleontology. We like the fact that, uh, or at least we like the documentaries that emphasize the science more than just the cartoony nature of it. Uh, Don't get me wrong, I do like the cartoons regarding dinosaurs, but I think the thing that we really had the passion for was the science. Uh, We would read through tomes about dinosaurs, and we wanted to make sure that our products looked accurate, and not only that, we wanted to root it in things that are around today that we also have a love for because not only do we like paleontology, we like modern zoology. Uh, so we combed through our knowledge of uh, modern animals and figured out which ones matched best with the animals that we have on display. Um, and uh, that's how we came to this conclusion. <laughs> and can you describe one of the cards to me? Because I know that these are a whole process to make them. So can you walk me through exactly how you go about creating them? Sure, I'd be more than happy to. It's a bit tough in an audio recording to really... Uh, <laughs> ascertain exactly what these things look like but in essence we go through a pretty rigorous process to cultivate each one of these cards. We start with the skeletal reconstruction which is based upon research within the academic literature and in some cases actually looking at the original specimens. Then we go from there and cultivate the life restorations based upon those skeletals and once we've gotten in essence that core artwork in place we go through what we call our vectorization process in essence. We go and we translate the original 
original paintings into structures that are based upon just a whole slew of geometric shapes. So that's what really cultivates the unique aesthetic that we have in the company as a whole. Now dealing with the cards specifically, the process that we run through on there was a whole bunch of trial and error. We were very fortunate to, um, you know, I guess have the patience and at this point in time the time to cultivate it. Um, but in essence what we did is we developed a process wherein we took kind of traditional paper stock, laminated it using this soft touch material that gives it its unique feel. And then on top of that, we laid the artwork itself in full color form and then did essentially what amounts to a 3D printing process for the card. So we um, placed layer upon layer of this gloss material such that we could actually embed the skeletal of the animal on top of the life restoration. So after that process, it takes a couple of days to bake so that it cures properly and then you have what you see in front of you, which obviously in audio form isn't going to translate all that well. Yes, so. and I, worry, it like, I don't even know if you can tell how awesome they are unless you actually get to hold them in your hand because you can actually see their color images, reconstructions of what these animals looked like, but when you look at them in the right light, you can see the skeleton underneath, and it's just, they're so cool. So will you just tell me, will you describe which ones each one is and how you chose the coloring for them? Because I thought that that was really, really cool how you did that. Um, I guess we can start from right to left. Okay. We have a Ceratosaurus, which is based upon a caiman lizard. Um, that one was actually Scott's, uh, Scott Hartman's choice as far as the coloration. He figured that that worked best, uh, the caiman lizard being predatory, and the same with uh, the Ceratosaurus. Uh, we have a Styracosaurus, which has its coloration based upon an eastern collared lizard. Um, we just figured that the uh, flashy colors on the head of the eastern collared lizard may be appropriate for some sort of ceratops and since they already had elaborate ornamentation on their heads. Um, we have a leopard gecko for our Amargosaurus. Um, that, we figured, maybe might be along the lines of the coloration of a giraffe, but we wanted to make sure to have a reptilian um, origination of the color. Uh, we have probably the most accurate being the uh, blue-spotted monitor for the Tylosaurus, given the fact that um, uh, Mosasaurs, in all likelihood, were related to uh, monitor lizards. Um, we have a vermilion flycatcher for our Bambi Raptor. Um, that, I think we took the liberty, I, I just love the color red, and I figured it looked perfect with uh, a Dromaeosaur, it just is a very flashy color. Um, so. Uh, then finally we have our Demetrodon, which is based upon a red-eyed crocodile skink. We figured it would be nice to have sort of a flashy sail in case that was used for uh, sexual selection, um, and we figured it really stood out that way. Awesome. And that actually proved to be the derivation for our logo. We had a highly stylized Demetrodon that we used as the basis for the Permia logo itself, and so that same color scheme from the red-eyed crocodile skink wound up translating into the design that we cultivated for that. Cool. And then so you have the Kickstarter campaign going on right now. So you have the cards and then you also have t-shirts. So is that the goal is to make more animal cards and then also focus on the t-shirts? Our goal certainly is to diversify as much as possible. We'd love to cultivate a whole array of additional animals. On average, though, each package that we develop, each creature that we cultivate takes us the better part of two months. So the array that you're looking at on the table over here is actually comprised the better part of a year's worth of work. So we're hoping to expand that line and we're also hoping to expand into a variety of additional garments on top of the ones that we have currently so we have um, you know just conventional t-shirts obviously with our special touch applied to them um, but we're hoping to perhaps expand into hoodies sweatshirts some other garments that might be more suitable for casual wear and on top of that you know just in general we're keeping an eye out for opportunities to utilize the same sort of artwork and presentation that we have in other mediums so maybe stickers in the future some other kind of fun accessories that would go along with it oh, well I think coming to SVP was obviously a very good choice for you guys because everybody Everybody has been so excited to see this, and we're always excited to see anatomically correct things like this. Oh, so um, I will put up the link on our website to their Kickstarter, and thanks for talking to me, guys. Oh, thank, thank you. you. We really appreciate it. That's it for episode one, but please make sure you catch the second part of Caitlin and Liz's coverage of SVP 2016 from Salt Lake City coming soon. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin-Silverstone and Caitlin Colary, who was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. 
Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.